For, uh, for those of you just joining us, this is HighTechFever.tv. I'm your host, Joe Sponson. My guest today, Dustin Cook. Uh, Dustin, you were just telling us about your blog, prospecttheory.blogspot.com. That's right. Uh, which is one of the venues and vehicles for you to, to be exploring this, 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 this domain, looking at, at how classical economics, among other things, doesn't necessarily uh, adequately, the theory doesn't necessarily tell us what happens in practice. And that's usually that's not a good right. sign for a theory. It implies that there's room for, for more thinking about how things actually happen. Yeah, and, and, and prospect theory and these mm -hmm. behavioral like economists, what, what, what other kinds of things are they, are they concentrating on? Well, so I've got another good example, uh, which is the idea of anchoring. Mm, okay. All right. Okay. And, uh, and this, you know, our the anchoring point. in a social context. Yes, anchoring a social context, the idea that uh, if you're presented with a number, mm. like at the negotiating table, someone throws out right. a number. Uh, it's very hard to ignore that. So, in fact, it, it actually influences the negotiation, where that comes out, or, or in a pricing situation. It can influence the, the type of price that a, that a customer is willing to pay. Mm. So, uh, I love, there's a good example, uh, Dan Ariely, uh, who was uh, now at Duke, but uh, was, uh, was at MIT, and uh, uh, Drazen Prelik, uh, who's, uh, who's still at MIT. And He's both marketing uh, faculty members in, in MIT Sloan, and, and, and actually, Ariely, curiously enough, was jointly appointed between the Media Lab and the Sloan School. But those two did what? Well, uh, and uh, George Lowenstein, they did a great study to show how the last two digits of your social security number can actually be made to influence uh, what type of price you're willing to pay for an item. So they did an experiment with Sloan students. I've <laughs> well, okay, so this is, well. <laughs> this is predictably yeah. irrational MBA. That's right. Well, that's what right. was the experiment? The last two digits of your social security number, right. which and are that, that random. Was, yeah, exactly. That was used just to be a random number. So they, had, uh, they presented a number of items, but let's say a bottle of wine. Mm. They would have you, you know, that would show up on a piece of paper. They'd have you write down the last two digits of your social security mm -hmm. number, which mm -hmm. can be anything from double zero to 99. All right. And then just ask, you know, would you pay that price for the wine? Yes or no? That price in dollars? In dollars, that's right. Uh, you know, and, and theoretically that should have nothing to do and with the And it should be a pretty even across 120 students and 100 students in the class, there should be a pretty even that's distribution right. of that's numbers. That's right, and there was, okay. and there was. Uh, and then they asked these uh, same students then, well, okay, what price would you pay? What price would you be willing to pay for that? And it turns out for the For the item, right? So there's would you item. pay your last two digits number, and then Separate from that, in time. Yes, yeah, separate from that, they just at, not in time. Just right afterwards, they ask, okay, you know, you won't pay the, you know, O2 right. uh, for your, for the wine, or maybe you would at the maybe that's not bad, wine. but okay, yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, what would you be willing to pay mm. for wine? And it turns out that had a lot of influence on purchasing preferences and and the what willingness to pay. So those those students that happen to have 80 and above social security numbers were willing to pay a whole lot more for the bottle of wine than students who randomly just happened to have digits that were 20 or below. Really? And it's not because it has, it has, their social security zero number connection. has a power. Right. It's, it's a purely random. Anchoring has a power. Interesting. So it's anchored by the number that you presented with early on. That That's you, right. Now that sounds like sort of a toy exercise, an interesting experiment. Does it? Does it? Does it matter? In, I mean, can that be turned into um, something online? Can Amazon or Ticketmaster, or, you know, one of those companies, uh, anchor people up? So I, I myself am very interested in helping people make better decisions. Oh, so get unanchored. Get, <laughs> get out of these okay, yeah. But sir, sure, there's there's all sorts of great ways to. Uh, you know, bring this to bear, you know, whether sure, it's sure. in a negotiation or online mm -hmm. pricing environment, uh, you name it. Wow, well, so there's one good example, it sounds like anchoring. What else, what else is a case well, example of this kind of, kind of you know, realm of, uh, of, of, of research? Sure. Well, these things can also be brought to bear for good. Uh, so uh, Thaler at uh, Chicago, for instance, is the author of Nudge, which is a, is a great example mm. of this. This is a recent book? It is a recent book. Uh, uh, based on a, a body of work that's been going up for some time, but uh, they looked at uh, default, like default options on forms, like mm -hmm. let's say your 401k form. You know, so this is, this is d default meaning it, when you sign up, there's some yeah. automatic things that are chosen on your behalf unless you say otherwise. 
That, well, that, uh, that was one of the solutions that they had in some ways, is that uh, you need to have, they called it a libertarian paternalism in terms of how you design these things because... <laughs> Isn't that oxymoronic? Which is a great oxymoron, but actually I love it. it, it uh, a few levels libertarian deeper. Libertarian paternalism? Wait a minute. <laughs> well, it's, it's, explain that. Well, you have to acknowledge that uh, this, this structure of a game, if mm. you will, you know, be it signing up a form or or uh, anything else in life, the structure in which you make these kind of decisions, supermarket shelves, how mm. high the candy is, et cetera, affects you know, your, your eating habits in that case. Uh, so you know, the people who are putting these structures together are going to have an influence one way or another. All right. so and it could be intentional or it could be by accident, but it sounds like right. this is a place where, <laughs> where intentionality is high because they want to squeeze you. And of course, you as a, as a customer should be thinking, well, yeah, as a customer, you need to be recognizing that the, that the structure, you know, does influence your decision. But uh, the idea of the paternalism, mm. like in the 401k, so yeah, let's kind of getting that. back to that, is that, uh, you know, if you have to opt into something, you know, if the default option is set that, well, I need to do something in order to start saving money and for my retirement, it turns out people kind of stick with the default they option. They don't. They just say, well, maybe I'll get around to it later. That's right. Well, I don't know if I need that. Never end up signing up. So the flip side is... Make the default option that you're enrolled in the in the 401k program. So you're going to save you unless you say, "I don't want to save." Right, and you have to have a default either way. Right. Interesting. So you know, this is again where the philosophy would come in of libertarian control. So yeah, I see. Make it. Make so it you give them the, the choice, but That's you try right. to bias them by by having the the the. the, the the default choice, right. the uh, a one that's in your interest, if you were thinking rationally about this, that's right. <laughs> about the circumstances. That's right. Yeah, you need to make uh, yeah. freedom of choice and change as easy as possible. Yeah, but, but given that there has to be a default option, try to make it the one that uh, that seems to but be in the best. Putting it interest. in their best interest. That's not a. That's not really. I guess it is paternalism in, in in the in the pure positive sense yeah. of the word, right? Yeah. So I mean, there's you know certain Eternal. connotations with both of those terms, but uh, we need but a neutral. Uh, what's in your best interest? But okay, so yeah. there's a very good example. And, and studying that, how did that, how did they get sussed out? How do you figure out that there are those two, you know, uh, consequences? Well, this this is uh, one reason I'm a big fan of uh, you know experimentation. Yeah. In the okay. Realm. And you can't do that in all contexts. Obviously, you know, in a live company, it gets a little more tricky, etc. They were able to do a few experiments, but. But you can do these behavioral experiments on a smaller scale mm -hmm. in a classroom setting, on a forum, on the internet, yeah, sure. uh, just to you know kind of uh, understand these uh, these behavioral. And it gives you sort of a cue as to as to how populations of people would behave. That's right. Doing these experiments under more controlled conditions is not intended to replicate the real world, but it's to give you a pretty good indication. Right, and, and in the real world, it's messy. There's all sorts of right. influences at one time. So this, you know, in an experimental way, you're able to, you know, isolate the mm. variables that you're interested in and uh, and see what happens. What are some other uh, sort of open realms in this in this in this broad domain, behavioral economics, uh, experimental sociology, in some sense? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a it's a wide open field. I think mm. some of the the kind of uh, hot topics right yeah. now are, are dealing with uh, superstition, for instance. Superstition. So. You know, a superstition is uh, you know a belief that comes to being that's you know based partially on the evidence that are you, know, you can observe, but it, it turns out it's a naive theory. It's uh, you know not not related to the underlying causality. It's right. uh, you know it's uh, it just happens to fit a few of the facts. So this is like people telling themselves or rationalizing a situation. Is that what you mean? Well, you know, uh, you know, rationalizing a situation is a process where these new superstitions may come about. Mm -hmm. But uh, it could be something like, you know, which is the faster checkout line? You know, you can develop a theory about, you know, whether I should switch lines or not. Right. And, and, you know, uh, if you know how customers, uh, in a marketing context anyway, are, are forming these theories, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and when they're not good for them and when they are good right. for them, you need to, to recognize that. Interesting. Interesting. Now, what are other examples? Is superstition one's a good one? Theory formation? Well, okay. actually, I had a, I had a test I wanted to run. On. Oh yeah, uh oh, <laughs> I'm going to be a guinea pig. Maybe, maybe not the <laughs> all right, well, on all of us, on all of us. What, but, like, uh, what's the test? There, well, there's it's something called the cognitive reflection test, oh, and uh, okay. it was developed by uh, Shane Frederick, uh, mm -hmm. who was a professor at uh, MIT in the marketing department. Uh, and the idea is is that and what's it called now? Cognitive. This is the cognitive reflection mm -hmm. test, okay. CRT. Okay. Uh, and the idea is that 
you know, when we try to make decisions and try to answer questions, you know, these are some simple questions, there's often a, you know, a little voice that kind of jumps in with an answer faster than we'd like to like it to. Mm. And often, uh, if we can't shut down that answer and think about it a little more rationally, it, it can be hard to avoid. And, All 